75 is good. All right, now we're, we're going to try to do a little bit. Here's our introductory slide uh, for today. We're going to observe light, and hopefully you're already taking a look at this. What I want you to do is uh, get your... Oh, man, this has got a huge thumbprint on it. Not for me. Okay, somebody else. Anyways, what I want you to do, is look at this incandescent light source. So, so this is observation one, incandescent light source. It is emitting heat because it is hot, H-O-T high temperature. And I want you to orient your diffraction grating so that you can see straight through to the actual object. And also to left and right, you see the rainbows. Now, if you have it so that your rainbows are above and below the light, turn your, your uh, little slide 90 degrees and then you'll have rainbows left and right. And that's the way to observe the things that we're doing. Now, uh, Drew, could you actually come up here and operate the lights and stuff? Would that be all right? So we're going to, I'm actually going to keep the uh, podcast going. And uh, Chris, I think we're good. Okay. Okay. Can you go over here? Um, and what we're going to do is go to, um, from uh, lights off to, um, back to 75% or 100. Okay, so what I want you to do, we're going to turn the lights off, and I want you to really look at this um, rainbow, okay, left and right. All right, go ahead and turn the lights off. And take one of those uh, uh, diffraction greetings so you can see it too. Okay, and what I want you to notice is the, the different colors and where the different colors are, okay? And... And then we're going to make a note under observation one. Okay, lights. Okay, so in your notebook now, I'll turn the lights back on for you. Uh, go ahead and make a note of what you just saw. We'll dip the lights again in a second so you can re-verify what you observed. And vocabulary term. This is a continuous spectrum. In other words, you get all the colors from violet over to red. So violet blue, green, yellow, orange, red. And if you were a, an insect, you might be able to see a little infrared. But I don't see any insects seated in the classroom today, so that's good. All right, uh, dip the lights off. All right, re-verify. Okay. And everybody can see, good. Okay, lights up. All right, now that's incandescent. And just make a note, it is emitting, I mean, if you put your hand here, you'll feel the heat. It's emitting light because it's heat. Now I have a different kind of lamp up here that I'm gonna show you. And this first one is a little bit different. And I'm going to have to, this one's not omnidirectional. Lights off, please. Okay. Um, take a look at this one. And I'll, I'll shine it over here for you guys on the right side of the room. And I'll get it over here to you guys on the left in just a second. Okay. Okay, you guys on the left. Here you go. Take a look. And let me... this out of the way. All right, lights. All right, go ahead and make a note. And what you should make, this is observation number two. This is hydrogen. It is a glass filled tube with electrodes high and low. And between the two electrodes is a very high voltage electric field. Okay, it is not necessarily that hot you know, it's not generating a lot of heat, but it, because of the voltage, it is generating a lot of light. And that light, the light of hydrogen, has a very particular set of colors. Uh, what was the brightest color, do you think? The, the reddish one? 
Did you guys see that? Did you say two purpley blue lines? It's it's not. Sometimes you can't see it, but the, let's let's re-verify. Go ahead and turn the lights down. Okay, you guys on the left. Here's your. And I always like to look for that, you know, that kind of bluish purpley one. All right, you guys on the right. Here we go. They're kind of hard to see, but. And then, of course, you have the central image itself. It looks like it's naked eye, but it's not naked eye. It's the image that you see from the diffraction gradient. The central image is perfect. It looks like the naked eye image. It's the side images left and right that are what we call dispersed. That's dispersion of light. The fancy name for that vocabulary term. Go ahead and turn the lights up. The fancy name for that, what's happening is diffraction, D-I-F-F-R-A-C-T-I-O-N. This one, hydrogen, has certain specific colors. And for that reason, the vocabulary term is, dif is a discrete spectrum. Let me spell that for you. D-I-S-C-R-E-T-E. -E. Discrete. In other words separated colors and only a few of them. It's not continuous. And that is significant. Uh, up until the early 1900s, nobody knew why that happened. They didn't discover it until the 1800s, and it took them mm, 50, 60 years to figure out exactly why. And that's involved with the quantum theory of the atom, which we will learn a little bit about this semester. Okay. Uh, let's do another light source. And this one uh, is helium. Lights. Okay, you guys on the right side of the room, you get first shot today uh, on this one. Go ahead and make a note of the, the central image color. So in other words, to your naked eye, what does this color look like? That's significant because we know that the light is a sort of very specific colors. It's a discrete spectrum. But those discrete colors combine to give you the naked eye color, which is not, you know, so the, so the hydrogen will look kind of pinkish, but not pure red. And this one, I don't know, what... What word would you use for this? Go ahead and turn on the lights. Mustard? Amber color? And write down the word that you think that goes with this color, the naked eye color. And then the other colors. Make a note of which one is closest to the central image. Make a note of which one is brightest. How many are there? How many did you see? Are they the same as hydrogen? All right, or no? Uh, right, go ahead and write that down in your notes, and we'll dip the lights here in just a second. So I'll give you time to come on up here and get one of these diffraction gratings. Hurry up. Thank you. There you go. All right now we're look, now. Don't put your fingers on the plastic part. Hold it by the paper, the by the cardboard side. All right, dip the lights. Let's re-verify. All right, here we go again. Let's take a look at it. So hopefully the people in front of you, their big head is not blocking the light. But I'm not, I'm not accusing anybody, but... All right, so re-verify. Okay, you guys on the right, here you go. All right, get another eyeball. That's good. Go ahead and uh, turn the lights up. All right, so make a note. This is helium. And again, it is not producing light because it is hot. It is producing light because it is trapped between or in the middle of a high voltage electric field. You could hear that buzzing. That's from the, gener the uh, transformer. Um, What does the diffraction grading remind you of? 
Kaleidoscope. Okay, good. Kaleidoscopes have effects like this. What else? What? 3D glasses? Uh, no, 3D glasses are one red, one blue, different eyes. That's that's not really what's happening here. That's not dispersion of light. That's kind of, you know, brute forcing light. Uh, what else does this remind you of? What? Rainbow, yeah. Uh, what? It, what do rain? What, what makes a rainbow? Not a prism. Prisms don't make rainbows. Well, okay, yeah, they do kind of make a rainbow. Raindrops and raindrops and prisms refract light. So make a note of that. Now this is a side note because what you have is a diffraction grating, but it's similar effects to a refraction prism or refraction in a droplet of water or any other body of water or any fluid. All right, so the refraction and diffraction are two different ways to disperse electromagnetic radiation into respective colors. If it's, an, if it's a thermal source like that first light, it will have all the colors of the rainbow. If it's a pure source of a certain element, it'll have a discrete spectrum, which you just looked at. Now I have a third mystery element here. Let's take a look at it. Okay, cut the lights. Okay, you guys on the left. Oh, this one's really vibrating. Okay, and I'm not going to tell you what this stuff is, but I'm going to allow you to make an educated guess. All right, lights. Okay, go ahead and make a note. Um, this is observation number four, mystery element number one. Observation four of the mystery element. Any guesses as to what element this is? It's not hydrogen, it's not helium. What do you think it is? N-E-O-N? -E is correct. You won the lot. No, you didn't win the lottery. Hey, did the guy that won over there in, Bravo in uh, Melbourne Beach, did he, did anybody listen on the news? Did he come forward? Yeah, one in California, one in Tennessee, and one here. Amazing. Even one of those, a third of that. 500 million bucks. Unbelievable. Okay, uh, dip the lights and let's re-verify. Okay, you guys on the right, you get first shot. Okay, go ahead and re-verify. And we'll just add to your notes. Yeah, this is neon. And, okay, here you guys on the left. Right, you can take one more look, uh, just to re-verify your observations and so forth. Okay. Uh, and that is neon. Now, why are spectra important? Well, let's talk about why spectra are important. So we're taking notes now. We're taking a little bit of astronomy notes. And we'll get to the syllabus in just a minute. The specific set of colors a combinate for, for helium, for instance, kind of a strong yellow. Was yellow the strongest line for helium? What do you have? Was that the strongest? Okay. And it did, did and helium. Thanks, Drew. You can help. Thanks for helping me out. Let's give Drew a hand. He did a nice job. <laughs> um, did helium have any red in it? Were any of the lines red for helium? Yes, no, or maybe. There was some red in helium. 
Uh, was there any green or blue? There was? Green and a dark blue. Did hydrogen have any yellow? No, it didn't. All right, so, so you see how these things, they're specific to each element. Every time you see the set of colors for hydrogen, even if you're looking at some distant star in another galaxy, you know that that star has got hydrogen in it. Similarly, if you see the set of colors for helium, uh, you know that there's some helium in that star. And those two elements are actually most of the visible matter in the universe. So the visible universe, 74% of it is hydrogen. You can make a note about that. 25% of the visible universe is helium. And the last fraction of a percent or so is everything else. Carbon, gold, lead, aluminum, everything else is just a very small fraction of what we see in the universe. But um, we can treat those spectral lines, uh, those especially the discrete spectra, like fingerprints for every element in the periodic table. Matter of fact, molecules, you know, like water or molecular oxygen, two oxygen atoms bound together, they have very specific discrete spectra. And some of those spectra might be in the ultraviolet uh, or down in the infrared or even in radio frequency. And uh, uh, so we, we have made, um, we started studying spectra with the simple element hydrogen uh, and the visible colors. But hydrogen has a whole other series of colors. Um, I shouldn't say colors, a whole other series of um, diffraction of uh, spectral lines that are in the ultraviolet and a whole other set that are in infrared. They're, they're considered series. So there's, there's three famous, famous series of ultraviolet, visible, and infrared spectral lines for hydrogen. And so we use those as fingerprints. If you have a microwave oven and you use it to heat up some food, the only way that'll work is if there's water in the food. All right? Anything that's dry, it won't really heat it up that much. Or maybe if it has some kind of liquid in it. But normally the, height, the microwave oven is set up with a very specific frequency of electromagnetic radiation, microwave radiation, that is absorbed by water and causes, it actually causes the water molecule to spin. And that's what heats up uh, all the other water and nukes all the, all the other things in turn up to a, a, a certain temperature. And that's how your food cooks in a micro. Um, and that's because of the spectrum of water that uh, either emits or absorbs that specific wavelength of microwave radiation. Because they're like fingerprints, they can tell us the composition of all kinds of things. Now this thing up here, see that big black area? It looks like they thought, whoa. You know, when they first saw it back in the 1800s, they thought, whoa, that's a, that's a hole in space. And that's what it's known as Barnard 68. But you know what it is? In infrared, you can see right through it uh, in the infrared wavelengths. And you know what it is? It's a big uh, blob of cold hydrogen gas, hydrogen uh, H2, molecular hydrogen. And it absorbs a lot of visible light um, because it's so cold. And, and we know that because we know what hydrogen does here on Earth, it does up there in Barnard 68. Actually, uh, Barnard 68 is absorbing, whereas this stuff we've set to emit. But it's the same colors. So it's, it's absorbing the same colors um, that what we observe being emitted here. Uh, so Barnard 68, it's called a molecular cloud, a molecular cloud. And we know that because of looking at the spectra. So spectra are important. Here's another thing. This is a rather small uh, asteroid called Ida. 
58.8 kilometers by 25.4 kilometers by 18.6 kilometers. So this would cover up a couple counties of Florida, maybe. I mean, if you could lay it down on the surface of the Earth. And um, there's a bunch of asteroids much bigger than that. And we know the uh, composition of those because we know what... Um, uh, it's, it's basically a big rock. Uh, we know uh, what rocks do here on Earth. You know what kind of spectra rocks produce. Granite, uh, sandstone, limestone, basalt at the bottom of the ocean. We know what they all do, Charles. And so... Uh, we know it from Earth. We can therefore say, ah, when I see it on an asteroid, I know what kind of rock is up there. So we kind of know uh, at least the surface. You know, we might not know what's under the surface very well until we actually get a spacecraft up there uh, to prospect around. And we have done that. We've already crash landed one spacecraft on uh, the uh, asteroid called, e <coughs> excuse me, called Eros. Uh, number about, let's see, that was in the late 90s. Uh, it's, you know, spacecraft transmitted, it landed, crash landed, and it transmitted information back, and it is, then they shut it down, and it is up there whenever we need it. We might need it one day. Here's another thing. The Hubble Space Telescope, HST, and other observation platforms, they look at all different frequencies. So X-ray, gamma ray, uh, ultraviolet, visible of course. Hubble's mostly visible and Hubble also has um, excellent infrared optics, optical systems, uh, and even radio frequencies. The, if you've ever seen that movie Contact with Jody Foster and all those guys and they're looking for life on other planets. What those guys are doing, they're listening with big radio telescopes that they look like a satellite dish on your house that picks up the satellite broadcast, uh, but they're, you know, like a hundred times bigger or more uh, gigantic um, radio dishes. And they'll get radio frequencies and we can see really high precision stuff in radio frequency. So this one, the Hubble Space Telescope and other things, they're very, very intent on learning about the Big Bang Theory and what we can deduce about the history of the universe going all the way back as far as we can to the Big Bang. Now, we can't go all the, all the way back to time zero, but uh, we can go back to the first uh, few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, and we're working on figuring out uh, stuff earlier than that, so... Uh, so spectra are important, and it's one of the things that we're going to be talking about uh, at the Wazoo this semester. So sp discrete spectra and continuous spectra of thermal uh, objects. Now, I'd like to ask you a practice question with your eye clicker. Let's try that. And I want you to turn it on and hold the power button down until you get a flashing square. And then type in BB. Our frequency every day is going to be BB. So hold the power button down, get the square flashing, and then hit B twice. And then you'll get a message that says go nitro. And that means you're, you're, you're synced with my computer up here. Uh, raise your hand if you got go nitro. Ooh, ooh. Nobody got go nitro? Just, just type BB and it should say go night. Hmm. Well, let me try to. Uh oh. Press AA. I thought I had it set to BB. The reason they have different frequencies, if somebody's upstairs or next door with one of these units, they'll, and they have the same frequency as me, you'll be clicking into his system. You know, see so your SOL. All right, AA. We'll try that. And But for, mo for most of the time, we're anybody got going nitro now? For frequency AA?
Who's got ready? Okay, that means you're good. Uh, and that means you're ready for a very, very advanced scientific practice question. Now, I want you to, th you know, think your most scientific thoughts when you answer this question. So this is just a practice question. But we'll have regular astronomy questions next Tuesday and every lecture after that. Maybe a few Chuck Norris questions. Okay, 15 seconds to vote. Good, I'm getting a lot of responses. I've got 94 votes. And hey, you guys, if you get a check mark, uh, raise your hand if you got a check mark on your, that means Ding, I've got it. That's my computer telling your clicker. Got it. Okay. Question. Got a check mark? On mo okay, good question. Do you have to press the send button? On multiple choice like this, the answer is no. We will be typing in letters and numbers, alphanumeric data, eventually. Um, you know, when we're doing a calculation, we'll type in some numbers. And then you have to type in the send button. But if it's a multiple choice, all you have to do is click A, B, C, D, or E. Uh, all right, let's see what you guys voted for here. All right, here's the... What? Who voted for... Justin Bieber... Uh, I don't know about you guys. I, I mean, I'm going to have to work hard with you guys. Whoever voted for Barney or Justin Bieber, I don't know. That's, that's a little dubious to me. Anyway, here's the correct answer. You probably didn't know this. Bruce Lee, officially tougher than Chuck Norris, but uh, it was in a movie, The Way of the Dragon, back in 1972. But they were actually good friends, as you can see in this picture. Epic workouts together. Uh, you can read about Chuck Norris probably could tell you about him if you ever get to talk to Chuck but uh, Bruce Lee died a long time ago uh, suddenly but uh, Bruce but Chuck Norris is still around and he can tell you all about his friend Bruce Lee all right let's go and talk about the syllabus um, and finish this up and the first thing I want to talk about is uh, homework and some of our homework is going to be in web courses, but most of it will be in masteringastronomy.com. Also, it will usually go from one lecture to the next. So if I assign you something, you know, Thursday afternoon, it'll be the next, due the next Tuesday. All right. And if I assign you something Tuesday afternoon, it'll be due the next the next uh, lecture on a Thursday. Okay, here's the masteringastronomy.com code, course code. Uh, and I noticed that a bunch of you have already registered over there. And I want all of you to get your, you know what, registered up in masteringastronomy.com. Okay, and there's, there's, a, there's a homework assignment that you can do. Raise your hand if you've already done it. It's just introduction to mastering. Okay, a couple of you, good. Um, and it'll be due uh, in MasteringAstronomy.com on Tuesday. So try to get that done over the weekend. It's pretty simple. Okay, now the, per the way that you get 25 points for your semester grade is straight percentage. So in other words, if you're, um, as the example says here, if you have 287 out of 320, then that's 89.7%. All right. That gets you 22.4 points uh, on your semester grade. So 0.897 times 25 is 22.4. Now, I always round up. So even if it's you know, like 22.4, normally to round that to the nearest whole number, you'd round that to 22. But I always round up just to give you guys a little break, keep things simple. So that, that would actually go down in the... Uh, Grade book is 23 out of 25 at the end of the semester. So you don't know what you're, you know, how many points you're going to get until we officially do the last homework sometime at the end of April. 
but you can always kind of tell where you are by just figuring out your percentage, then multiply by 25, you know, and figure out what you would have if it were the last day of the semester on that day that you're looking at it. We're also going to have some graphing, a little bit of graphing and diagramming homework. It'll be easy. Um, and uh, it'll be handed in on graph paper. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a few weeks. Uh, so now I want to talk about um, participation and eye clickers. And let's go down and get to that. Okay, here's eye clickers. And we've talked about this already. Um, I want you to register in webcourses.com or web, our web courses uh, website, ucf.edu. For those of you that may have had trouble, if you're on a Mac uh, operating system, a, la a laptop, a MacBook, or um, an iPad or something, try Chrome is what I hear. Or just go to the uh, library and uh, use one of the Windows boxes in the library, and that should get you squared away. I noticed it this morning, it loads pretty slowly into Safari. So, so try to get that done. You don't need to have a class code to register if you're using webcourses.ucf.edu. Uh, you may not use iClicker.com. It is worthless to me. Now you can do that for another class if your faculty tells you to do that. That's fine. But for my class, you have to use web courses. Question? Mastering astronomy, yeah. But not, oh, we're talking about iClicker. Yeah. Yeah, uh, mastering, uh, you need an access code, but iClicker, you, you just use, UC, your, your UCF NID is sufficient. In other words, you got to be on web courses and then register from your web courses area. Ding. It takes about two seconds. And I've got a bunch of yous. And also, I've uploaded um, a bonus point for everybody that registered as of about noon yesterday. And I'm going to update the roster right after class. So if you got registered this morning... Uh, right before class, uh, you'll have another bonus point. Matter of fact, you'll have three bonus points by the end of next week because you'll be registered early for three lectures. And we'll do a little bit of practice questions. So maybe a little Chuck Norris action and a little bit of astronomy. And then on the 26th, that's two Tuesdays from now, it'll be all astronomy. Uh, and we'll be asking uh, all the questions will be for real. Uh, so um, let's see. And that's explained here uh, in, this, in this blurb from the uh, syllabus. Also, it's, eye clicker work is participation. So it's not, I'm not going to count, to get your 25 out of 25, I'm not going to be counting how many you get correct. I'm going to be counting how many you answer, right? And so because of that, there's a couple conditions if you want to get those points. You have to actually be present in class with your eye clicker. It has to be uh, working order. And it has to be uh, registered in web courses. If you don't have those three factors, uh, you're, you're going to miss out on your participation, at least for that day. Now, there's some other factors I want to go uh, through with you, especially the 85% participation factor, um, and that's on this page. So let me go through this carefully. Okay, 85% participation. All right, so if you have an occasional absence from a lecture, that's not, I mean, you want to be here for every lecture, but I know stuff happens, you know, like you have to go to the dean or a dentist appointment, or you know what have you, or you you lo you f you forget your eye clicker at your buddy's house, and you don't get it for a couple of days, or, or anything like that. If you miss one or two lectures over the semester, um, regular lectures, it's not going to af affect your probably will not affect your twenty five out of twenty five, right? And that's because 
full participation I count as 85%. So if you're here for 85% of the questions, and we have about 25 lectures, uh, uh, regular lectures, in, in other words, not exams. So we have about 25 lectures uh, with questions. If I ask an average of four clicker questions per lecture, that's 100. If you're there for 85 of them or more, uh, you'll get 25 out of 25. Now, if you're fewer than that, well, then we have to scale down uh, the, uh, the pointage based on 85%. Uh, and so most of you are going to get 24 or 25 points on your eye clicker. But if you don't, um, if you're below 85%, we have to uh, calculate your pointage. And it goes like this. Here's an example. You might want to jot this down in your notes. Actually, it's in your syllabus. So I don't. Um, if you have, if there's 133 eye clicker 2 questions, for instance, and John Q student answers 92 of them. All right, that's 69.2%. So what we do is we divide 0 0.692 divided by 0 0.85. Okay, 85%, 0 0.85 is my performance criterion. If you make that, then you get 25 out of 25. If you don't, you solve that proportion for the numerator on the right side, JQS, and that's the number of points that you earn. Okay, and so for this guy... If you cross multiply and all that jazz and solve for JQS, uh, it works out to 20.35. And then again, I round that up. So it would actually go in the books as 21 out of 25. All right. Um, let me pause for questions about this part of the grading procedure. Okay, uh, let me make one more comment, and that is that by the end of the semester, you might have 25 points from homework and 25 points from clicking. You know, like April 23rd, it may already be set that you've got 25 and 25. All right, that's 50 out of 50. That's the same amount of points as a midterm. Now, you might not be within spitting range of even a 40 out of 50 on a midterm. But if you have 50 out of 50 from homework and clicking together, that is going to balance things out really nicely. And it's kind of hard to figure out exactly where you stand on any given day until the end of the semester. But yeah, those points are for if you're here faithfully in class, and if you do your homework faithfully, which... The way it's set up, if you can't do the homework, I mean, I, God bless you. It's, you, know, you know, I'm giving you your best shot. But the homework, I mean, you could do it anywhere in the world. It's online. You don't have to be in class to do it. You can be in Timbuktu and get it done and, and get those points. And um, uh, 25 out of 25 is really what you And most of you will be up there in that region, you know, maybe 49 out of 50. 46 out of 50. 46 out of 50 on a midterm, you'd be dancing in the streets. You know, some of you anyways. Um, and, but, you know, you can definitely do that with clicking and homework put together. All right, let's just recap the grading scheme. Here we go. Um, 25 from homework and mostly in masteringastronomy.com. A little bit in um, web courses from time to time. You know, there's certain things I can't do over in mastering. iClicker 2 in class, participation 25. Uh, graphing homework to hand in on graph paper, which we'll announce in a month or so, uh, 10 points. And then exams, two midterms and a final, 200 points. Total of 260, uh, the grading scale is, um, you know, what we, you know, what's published in your syllabus, 90% for an A. 75% for a B, 60% for a C, 50% for a, a D, below 50%, below 130 points uh, for an F. Most of you are going to be C's and higher, so just work your 
tail off and uh, see how high you can push it. And if you all earn A's, I'll give everybody an A. I don't believe in, and that's one of the reasons I don't curve. Because a curve, you can't break. I mean, if you, if you curve things, I, I can't reward people that work hard all the time. It prevents you from rewarding them. And, but that's what I want to do. I want to reward you if you really do good on exams and stuff and homework. So, All right, uh, questions about the syllabus before we move on to astronomy topics. Yeah, question. Homework is graded on the accuracy. Yes, yeah, so homework you got to do. It's a performance based. It's not a participation based. So performance means you got to get it right. But iClicker is based on participation. So, so if you're here for, and and the homework, you know, if you do a little bit of study and a little bit of reading and stuff, you're you'll get, you know, you'll stop the homework. All right, another question. All right, I want to talk to you about some of the targets uh, that we are going to be looking to acquire uh, this semester. In other words, what are some of the high spots? of the semester. Now, everybody knows about the planets, you know, Pluto's been demoted, so there's only eight now. Um, but we'll talk about the planets on our way to talking about other stuff. But the, the thing that, there's several things that really uh, tie the course together, and that's this set of three topics. Uh, number one, water on Mars. Endless, endless money going into NASA to and, and the European Space Agency and so forth to find water on Mars. Why is that? Well, you know, we want to find out if it's possible to live there and if there are things that are alive there. Now, here's a, a little, uh, one of the first rovers. We've got a bunch of them up there now. This one's now retired. Uh, I don't think it's, it's working anymore. But it's those rovers that they've had up there on Mars are just phenomenal. Here's a picture of Mars. Ice cap, just like Earth, up there at the North Pole, South Pole, the same. It's not in the picture, but you can see that, you know, there's, and, and up there, that's water ice, and it's CO, there's a lot of CO2 ice, dry ice up there in Mars. And the interesting thing about Mars is you can see enormous dust storms, you know, that blanket the entire planet when things are, are when the conditions are right. They have seasons, just like we do on Earth, and the weather storms and all that stuff, the size of the polar ice caps, uh, those all um, depend on the weather. So uh, basically, the reason that we like to study Mars, here's another picture, uh, look how straight that is. It looks like a runway, doesn't it? I mean, it's really straight. But they think it's because of uh, uh, plate tectonics on Mars a long, long time ago. Uh, it's the same, same as here on Earth, we have plate tectonics that create the rim of fire all around the Pacific Ocean. You know, all those volcanoes, like Japan is filled with volcanoes, and they have a zillion earthquakes. Chile and Peru, the same. California, Alaska. Uh, all those areas around the rim of the Pacific have um, unstable uh, geological plates. They think that this big scratch in the surface they thought originally it was from flowing water, but it, it's had flowing water in it, but it was, they think it's originally from a tectonic activity. But basically what we're trying to find out there is life. We want to find signs of life, and we also want to maybe somewhere down the line actually live there. Hey, raise your hand if you saw that movie, The Martian. I didn't see it yet. Is it any good? Does it suck or what? No, it's good. Yeah. I'll have to go see it maybe. Is it still in the theater? No? It's on, oh yeah, that's right. It's on DVD now. Okay. Maybe the dollar movie. All right. Okay, Stardust. Stardust is the name of this particular spacecraft, the Stardust mission, 
we flew a spacecraft to the coma, the you know, kind of like the the glowing part of a comet uh, called Wild Two a number of years ago, and then we brought that um, uh, back to Earth and we collected it, and so you could you they call it the Stardust mission and. What it collected was stardust with parentheses around it. But what they really did was they, they captured particles from this comet, Wild 2, that we think were part of the early solar system. In other words, all the way back to the formation of the, before the sun was a star, when it was just a blob, the solar system was this big blob of rock and dust and gas and stuff that eventually swirled together and congealed into the sun and a bunch of planets. Uh, that material, uh, we think, is um, in most comets. And we flew this spacecraft through the middle of it and collected uh, particles of, of that. And there's a big punchline to this, this whole uh, program, the Stardust mission. So these are the, this is the actual collection device. It's, uh, it was made with uh, aerogel, which is really light, but pretty tough. And they just wanted to get stuff, you know, little um, uh, smithereens of this coma uh, to embed themselves in this uh, aerogel. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Here's the, the Wild 2 comet. Here's a couple other comet nuclei, Temple 1 and Comet Borelli. Um, so it flew through with the aerogels exposed, and then a capsule bought, brought that aerogel stuff back to Earth, you know, parachuted it back to Earth, not the entire spacecraft. So um, here's the return capsule, okay, and from that spacecraft, and they had those sample canisters. Here's what the, here's what the aerogel looked like. Now, See those little things, those little white tracks up here, like this? That's like that's like on a uh, detective mystery on TV, and a lot of times they'll shoot um, a bullet into some gel or into something, and to see what what it leaves behind. And that's what this is. Th that thing was moving really fast, so these particles were really moving fast. When they hit this thing, and they, you know, but eventually they stopped. There's one famous particle that missed everything, but that particle is what we're going to learn most about. It hit the frame around the aerogels and le left this gigantic bullet hole. And the remnant, you know, how on like uh, Detective Mystery, they'll, you know, they'll check somebody for gunshot residue or for uh, gunpowder residue on their hands and stuff. Uh, they didn't have gunpowder residue in this big bullet hole, but they had other kind of residue. And that is going to tell us a huge tale. We'll get to that. And, and make a note, Stardust, we will have to understand atoms. We will have to understand nuclei of atoms. And we will have to know what an isotope is. Let me spell that vocabulary term for you. Isotope, I-S-O-T-O-P-E, isotope. We will have to understand thermonuclear fusion reactions a little bit. So the same um, thing that they use, you know, the, the no, these... Jokers over in North Korea that, that detonated a nuclear device, they say. They say it was a hydrogen bomb. A hydrogen bomb is a thermonuclear fusion explosive. And it basically fuses the nuclei of two hydrogens. And from that reaction, uh, you get a different nucleus and a whole lot of energy output. It's kind of weird how it works, but it does work. It's a fusion reaction versus an atomic bomb, what they call an atomic bomb, uh, like the one that they dropped in Japan, uh, that either uranium or plutonium, those act by way of fission, nuclear fission. 
They take a big uranium nucleus, not a little teeny hydrogen nucleus, but a big uranium or a big plutonium nucleus, and they break it apart. They fission it. They split it. They, you know, they break, smash the, smash the nucleus. And when they do that, if it's a big nucleus like uranium-235 or plutonium-239, then you get a lot of energy and an explosion. And that is the same reaction, uh, uranium fission, plutonium fission, that it powers nuclear reactors. We can control the nuclear fission reaction. It's not that powerful. I mean, it's powerful. But we have tough steel and, and, and electrical fields and stuff to, to uh, contain a fission reaction with uranium. But we have got no way to contain a fusion reaction. It is so powerful. Uh, the lightest thing in, in, the, in the universe, hydrogen, and yet it yields an enormous amount of uh, power. Uh, and energy, and uh, and that's what the sun is operating. The sun is burning hydrogen; it's fusing hydrogen down at its core. And uh, the photons that are produced by that, they kind of ricochet around inside the center of the sun because it's really dense. It's not like this room; you know, light, uh, the photons of light just go straight from the lamp right into your eye, or straight from these lamps to your diffraction, and then right to your eye. But in the sun, it's really dense underneath the surface of the sun. And so photons ricochet around, you know, for, they say for about a million years before they get out to the surface. And then once they get to the surface, then they stream away into space as sunlight uh, that falls on Earth and the other planets. But, but yeah, the sun, uh, nuclear fusion. And uh, we're, so to understand this, um, What's happening here, we're going to have to understand a little bit about how stars work. And the way that stars work is hydrogen fusion. You know, every, there's a zillion stars in the universe just like our sun. And those stars burn hydrogen. For, they have enough to burn for mil, billions and billions of years. Third target, the Hubble Space Telescope and other platforms. Oh, my goodness, what a wonderful instrument the Hubble Space Telescope has been. And we got better ones now. There we got a bunch of them up there. And of course, as good as the Hubble Space Telescope was, you guys were little shrimps when the, back in 1990. I was in grad school. But it, we, when, when they, were, they launched the Hubble, it's kind of amazing. Everybody was thinking, oh, man, we're going to discover the Big Bang and the, the mysteries of the universe. And in 1990, so they launched it, right? And, and I was in an optics class at the time. I was taking optics in grad school. And we were all talking, oh, man, this telescope, it's, you know, it's a big mirror and everything, optical and a little bit of infrared. And uh, it got up to space, and it was messed up. It was somebody in Connecticut at the Perkin Elmer Company that made the, the mirror they they shaped it like an, a thousandth of a millimeter wrong. And so as a result, that big, enormous billion-dollar mirror in the Hubble Space Telescope was farsighted. And it, it didn't focus. They couldn't focus it. So they could get images, but they were really fuzzy. And then they, they sent up in the Hubble, uh, or in the space shuttle, a bunch of guys like uh, Story Musgrave and, and those cats to repair it. And they put some, op some additional optics in there to get everything copacetic again. But I always thought that in those days, I mean, you guys probably don't remember it, most of you. I guess maybe some of you are old enough to remember. Um, in those days, it was the Cold War. And my guess was that, you know, NASA had won. Hubble Space Telescope. And my guess was that the CIA and the Department of Defense had about 20 up there, and they were all perfectly focused. They didn't have uh, uh, farsightedness of any kind, and they were perfectly ground and, and shaped, and, but they were looking down at Russia and China. And they couldn't let the Russians know, so they didn't want... So they, they made it seem that the Hubble Space Telescope was far-sighted when it really is, uh, in fact, a fantastic machine. 
fantastic observation platform. And we have learned a lot from it. Um, one of the things that we're going to uh, also hopefully talk about uh, are exotic astrophysical objects like black holes. Now, I'm an expert on black holes. That's what my research area is, black holes in the Big Bang Theory, quantum field theory and stuff like that. So I know all about that. And Hubble has given us a lot of information about that. I mean, so so here's a here's another fantastic observatory down in South America, the Paranal uh, Observatory, way up in the mountains. There's a big high altitude desert up there in uh, I think this is in Chile, and they put they have a bunch of big telescopes up there. This one's shooting a laser. It looks like it's sh shooting a laser at the middle of the Milky Way. That's the middle of the Milky Way where that laser beam is, is aimed, but, you know, it's not going to reach that far. Uh, but they do that to, to adapt their optics and get really, really high-quality images. Paranal. Fantastic. Here's what the center of the galaxy actually looks like. And in the middle of this, these little dots show you the trajectories of stars. Now, we can't see them in visible light, but we can see them in infrared. Okay, and in the center of our galaxy, there's a structure called Sagittarius A star, A with an asterisk. And all these little dots are, you can see that they're on little elliptical orbits, and we track them. We've been tracking them for decades, you know, that we've been looking at the center. And we've deduced that there's a big, big black hole about, uh, as I recall, 3.7 million times the mass of the sun. So it's a super big, super massive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And we think uh, almost all galaxies have a super massive black, a galactic black hole at the center. Now, big stars, um, bigger than the sun, can collapse on their own and form a black hole. But we don't know how a galactic black hole at the center of the galaxy forms. We have ideas, but it's a gravitational object. We can time every one of these orbits. That's why they're being measured. And from the timing of the orbits, we can figure out the mass. That is Kepler's law, Kepler's third law. And on Tuesday, we are going to start talking about Kepler's third law. So I'll see you Tuesday. You're dismissed. Look for your homework in masteringastronomy.com. It's ready to go. It's due on Tuesday. See you then. You are dismissed. Oh, uh, yeah, bring those uh, up here. Put them in, in the box up here. Definitely, I want them back. What are you, like a freshman? No, I just normally take night classes, so I've never really parked here during the day. And it's normally yeah. it's just empty. Welcome night, to the so, yeah, day classes are crazy. It is insanity. Yeah. yeah. All right, you won't be making that mistake. No, though, right? I think I'm gonna really yeah. make it too generic. Yeah, good. Our, our um, assignments in math and astronomy also uh, visible on web courses. No, we but I'll yeah, yeah, you have to have masteringastronomy.com to to see the homework and get to it. Thanks for helping me today, Jeff. Appreciate it. Uh, so, but I'll eventually put the data, you know, your scores and stuff up in web courses. But the work that you know, the clicking and the pictures and stuff, masteringastronomy.com. Okay, you guys, good. I register my undergrad on your web courses last night, but then I register, I click here under my name in class because I realized I would switch it to my name instead of friend's name. So I just want to make sure that it's my name in your class and not hers. What is your name? Amy. Turpening. Amy? Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> I've never had this happen before. Let's see if I can. It should come with my name.